so uh, i think we can uh, it is already 2:10 so we can start your session so i will formally uh, welcome you okay so hello dear uh, participants uh, this is a wonderful day uh, a tuesday 23rd march 2021 uh, we are going to start our uh, next uh, session uh, with uh, mr bhavik from cisco uh, who will be talking about uh, iot protocol stack typically he will talk about uh, bluetooth security and then he will also uh, talk about uh, the way uh, iot protocols work in sensor networks okay so uh, let's uh, keep our fingers crossed and learn from the technology leaders so i am really very happy and honored that uh, we have the best people from industry to take these lectures so uh, bhavik uh, so bhavik uh, has been uh, working in uh, cisco security uh and he has been assisting in uh, security deployments in large enterprise networks uh he has uh, he conducts uh, training on iot hack in mel bangalore and also uh, owasap c sites uh his uh, uh, interest lies in uh, iot digital forensics and also delivers uh, talks in uh, network forensics in mel uh he has also conducted the uh, first ctf for cisco by contributing challenges on reversing and binary exploitations okay some things which uh, all of us including me uh, have to listen to his lectures to understand it better uh, he has been a speaker for different universities like sn thapar cs seu sct and many many other in fact stalwarts are required everywhere so uh, we are really uh, proud that uh, we have him as today's speaker so he talks on iot and application security and he has much interest in cyber security and explores uh, new ways of uh, self learning research so we are happy that uh, we are connected with bhavik so we formally uh, welcome uh, bhavik to this uh, event and uh, in this session and let's uh, look forward to listen more from him welcome bhavik uh, yeah we Uh, go ahead please yeah thanks a lot sir uh, so before i start right i mean it's it's an honor uh, to to speak with you know, um, bright minds in one of the most premier institute in india has right uh, i still remember as a child since i am from mumbai i was uh-huh. used to visit uh, iit boy uh, a dream of uh, wow i mean trying trying to be in iit but unfortunately <laughs> all dreams Correct, correct. And now, now, now you are the speakers and the guest of IITs, huh? So, so <laughs> this yeah, is yeah. an unbelievable pleasure. Yeah, so, so, yeah. So it would have been great if it was in person. At least you can visit another. Correct. Uh, in fact, I would like to share that uh, yeah. almost nine sixty so, participants so, have registered in this event, and uh, there are many. Uh, students in third year fourth year phd scholars uh, from all across the country so the students are not only from uh, iit bhu or other iits rather uh, they are from uh, from all across the country uh, yeah. there are about uh, 200 faculty members who have also joined and trying to uh, follow uh, the uh, leaders talk so this is a mixed gentry we are few persons from industry also so we have a, a good gathering so okay please go ahead with your lecture yeah okay so uh, myself uh, bhavik uh, i am i am a technical leader in cyber security space basically uh, we work on deployments um, for large enterprise networks and also at the same time try to you know um, resolve issues which customers see in day to day i mean uh, the issues which they see in their day to day networks related to security and uh, and we basically uh, support a product which is an next gen firewall i i believe you would have heard the name of it it's called firepath threat defense uh, which has now been named as secure firewall so, so basically all we we look into building those next gen rule sets layer 7 rule sets and also at the same time help the customers in evaluating those rules and also the same and most importantly how do you 
configure those rules how to make sure that you know you you are protected from most of the attacks and especially the zero day attacks which which is the most common and generally uh, you you find challenges in in saving those or in protecting those so today uh, the session is more is is going to be on deep dive yeah as i mentioned but it's going to give you an understanding of what is the iot protocol stack or what is the stack with cisco recommends and then we would look into one of the iot protocol which is called ple which is widely used uh, which is something i mean which is when i say widely used it is almost used in all the healthcare departments or in almost all the verticals which you which you come across uh, mostly you would see that uh, ble is the one which which is used more often and we would see that why it is you know used more often why uh, we we have an alternatives we have so alternate so much alternatives but why ble is so much popular and at the same time what are the challenges and deployments and you know what are the different vulnerabilities generally uh, this session i do a hands on uh but unfortunately due to to this tough times uh, we are doing a remote session but generally i i do a hands on where uh, once because i always believe that uh, theory is one part but unless and until you don't do it yourself or at least you don't get a hang of it you 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 cannot generally uh, you know you do not feel the excitement that yes i have learned something so again okay, but due to the challenges what i would do is basically i would just run through at the end the different steps uh, i did what you do in a normal hands on and what is the end result you would achieve so that being said uh, the best part would be at the last uh, before that we would discuss about dli architecture as i mentioned what are the different vulnerabilities and how can you uh, again i am not encouraging here to exploit different devices but i am just saying that as a security analyst or as a security enthusiast you would always like to ev evaluate uh, how the device is performing either at the software level or at the hardware level so that is something which i did uh, and this is this session is about what i learned from that right so that's why i meant that exploiting a device both software and hardware again a uh, side note i am not here promoting that you should be exploiting but while you try to have while you try to determine what are the vulnerabilities in a device be it iot or be it any field right you tend to also learn different concepts you also learn tend to learn what is a protocol stack at which uh, put or basically at which layer the information is secured or at which layer the information can be exploited right so that's what the hackers do today so as as a security analyst it would be great that if if we do this on different devices right okay so before i start right um, before we start let's let's understand that why why iot is is a buzzword and you know and in today's connected world why do, do we see that iot is more required or why why do we see that most of the devices which are coming um mostly connected with the cloud so what what are the advantages so before we we look into that let's understand that what was a life or maybe a few years back what was a life without iot right so imagine this is a person who is leo and uh, as he's like me who wants to go to office but unfortunately yeah, due to covid he cannot go but imagine it was a covid free era uh, and um, in general what he would do is like i'm pretty sure 10 years back if we had to wake up um, for for an exam we we used to have an alarm i'm sure uh, the it folks don't need that because they hardly sleep right so they always keep on working on interesting ideas and that's where they you know sleepless but in this for a common or maybe a normal person like me who needs an alarm to go to office each day and you know so each day the alarm wakes him up at a specific time then he catches his train and goes to office right now 
this was the life without iot right so this was a normal uh, period where where he used to get you know uh, the train he has to catch a train he, he is being wake uh, alarm helps him to wake him up right but what changes with iot so the same alarm is being changed by a buzzword called smart alarm so can anyone tell me that yeah uh, apart from the di- i mean apart from the image uh, what what got changed why why it is called a smart alarm now i mean what 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 you know uh, is it is the alarm from a different planet uh, that's why it's called smart alarm or or there is actually some uh, some mechanism behind it uh that's the reason why it is called smart alarm so yeah feel feel free to answer or you know anyone who who wants to you know respond so can anyone say why why it is called smart alarm what got changed hello yeah i would like to have this as an interactive session uh and then just a monologue from my side because uh, yeah generally when i also attend sessions generally i also interact or you know generally answer few questions not all so i mean anyone who would like to answer that why it is called a smart alarm sir if we yeah sir if we compare as if we see as a, a smart alarm then we can say if if we get up early morning then alarm continuously in alarming but uh, if, if we are talking about a smart alarm then when we already get up at that morning then alarm will not alarm uh. and uh, Okay. Yeah. Good. Sorry. Yeah, and it will it will message or it will give a wake up and in the another message type. I think so. Uh, partially correct, uh, but not not entirely. So, anyone else? Uh, sir. maybe uh, it will wake us up on the weekdays and not in the weekends weekends uh possibly yes uh, then basically then you need to feed something right on on the yeah. smart alarm that wake me up in weekdays not on weekends correct yeah uh, yeah uh, th- that is a possibility and how, how can you do that uh, so let's consider that you want to program the alarm that it just needs to wake you up on weekdays and not on weekends so how you do that i mean do you th- do you think there is a way to do that or uh, it should be pre configured um, maybe uh, it uh, already has a calendar in it and it will know when it's sunday and saturday it, it's not going to go off but on the other days monday to friday it will go off uh partially but uh, let's consider that this particular alarm uh, the same product i'm going to let's consider it is being bought by 10 of your friends and they don't want the alarm to wake him up on tuesday but he uh, the rest of the day is it's fine for him so i mean if if there is no way of configuring the alarm right i mean there is no way of modifying the way you want then there is no then there is no point of calling it a smart alarm right because yes one of the one of or forget about smart alarm basically all the devices which we see today right they just have that buzzword or they just tell it's smart refrigerator or smart ac the reason being is um, that as you mentioned right that the alarm like you, you it it want or basically you want the alarm to wake you up only on weekdays but not on weekends but then you have to tell the uh, alarm right 
yes, today we have the AI features or today we you have the voice modulation features where you can just tell them that, you know, these are the days. But it has to be configured somewhere. And the way you configure that is through an application, which which is being given by that end device, right? So, for example, I'm talking about this alarm gear. So, are taking from a vendor X, right? Or it is being manufactured by a vendor X. So, what you do is basically you install the application from that vendor X uh, from from the Google Store, and what it would do is it would try to communicate with that device and it just gives you an interface where you can modify the values which is being provided by the vendor like for an alarm it would be generally as you mentioned that what is the uh, day on which the alarm needs to wake you up what is the time at which the alarm needs to wake you up and is is there any particular tune you want so that most of most of the times those would be the features which would be uh, required uh, as by an end user when you want to manage an alarm, right? Uh, so that is one of the reason. And the other most co most important reason is that this alarm is being connected with the internet, right? So wh what's the advantage? I mean, okay, uh, the alarm is connected with the internet. What's, what's in it for me? So as you can see that I just put a cross at the tree, right? So let's let's imagine that today, or, you know, the Leo is supposed to um, go to office on a particular day and there's a natural calamity which happens. Or let's consider there is some train strike which is happening, right, uh, for that particular day. Now, since this alarm is communicating with the internet, it's getting more, more of a real-time update that what is happening in his vicinity or what is happening in a particular location. Because now, when you are connected to internet, you also have the uh, reachability to the Google Maps, right? So you know that which location has a particular problem and which locations are like congestion free. So similarly, in this particular case, since this alarm is connected to the internet, it just gets a real time updates and just notifies Leo that, you know, today the train is just going to be it's not going to work. So rather than uh, waking him up at, at a normal time, what it does for him is maybe he can notify Leo that, you know, today uh, the, your normal route is not going to work and you need to take your personal car to visit your office, right? So that's where, the, so from here, what, what are the key takeaways or what do we learn, right? I mean, what was the difference between a normal alarm and a smart alarm? The normal alarm cannot speak to internet or it cannot get the real-time updates. So if there was any natural calamity which, is, which was supposed to happen, the end user is never going to get notified. And if the end user is not going to get notified, in this case, Leo, he would just, you know, do his, he would just wake, uh, wake up in his normal schedule and get ready to catch a train. But once he reaches the station, he comes to know that you know, today is a strike. So that's how the intelligence from the internet or the intelligence from the real-time uh, real environment helps you not only in modifying your schedule, but also at the same time uh, giving you an alert what is supposed to happen maybe 30 minutes later or maybe how is your day going to look like? Not exactly 100%. But just an indication of how your day, day is going to look like and what modifications you need to do. And the other important thing is, as we mentioned, you also need some kind of controller, which we say an application, which is going to control that particular device the way you want. Right. Now, let's consider an example of. Right? Now, nowadays you have a uh, smart refrigerators where you can. Uh, control the operation of your refrigerator with just a click on your phone. Now, how do you do that? Again, you need to install an application, which is nothing but a controller who's going to control that device. Application going to speak to that device. That is something which you are going to cover in the next slides. But just keep, keep. But is, is the idea clear that why in today's world, all the devices are being mm, termed as smart, you know. So now we have the smart fans, uh, like yesterday itself, I was seeing an ad where you can just with a click, uh, you can control the speed 
and uh, you can just switch it on and switch it off so even in that particular case how is it possible again the same thing you need to install the application which would act as a controller but at the same time how does the application fetch the information from the device that is something interesting i mean how it gets those information that is at the later part but is the understanding clear that why all the devices right you see ads today almost all the devices are being termed as smart so now does everyone get the real reason why why it is called smart and again one uh, one important point here is in this particular case the example which i took yes the alarm has a internet connectivity but some other devices right um, i mean like in a fan like in a fan you don't need a uh, internet connectivity why because it is to your home so the only thing which you require is a communication between the controller in the form of an application who is controlling the that particular device but say for example uh, you want a feature like if you are at home oh, sorry if you are outside and still you want to monitor uh, um, let's consider an example of cctv right so um, you want to monitor your home that even if you are outside you still want to keep a check on uh, if if you know no thief is entering your home so in that particular case you have a cctv which is installed in right in front of your door but there is an application which is communicating with your device over the wifi so in those scenarios yes you would need a internet connectivity and the advantage which you are getting is even if you are remote you can still monitor right so i hope uh, this is clear does anyone has any questions feel free to ask i hope the pace is good i'm not that fast if i'm fast let me know i can just tone it down okay so i hope this is clear right any questions yes sir sorry no sir okay perfect then it comes the, then what do we mean by iot so anyone i mean this is the image which you see in front of you so what can you think of iot or how do you coin the term iot yes it is called internet of things which means there are devices which are connected to internet but what else so as you can see there are different verticals right so as i mentioned that you have a cctv at your home you have smart home smart cities right? you know so nowadays i am pretty sure everyone would be using google maps right so when when you are supposed to go to a particular destination uh, the google map just alerts you that this route is congestion has congestion and this particular route is congestion free and this route would take you you know maybe 10 minutes uh, it would take you 10 minutes faster as compared to the congestion route so that's what now now how does that happen is because of because now what google maps does is is like you know uh, since google maps has been installed on different mobile devices it basically tracks the location of of that particular endpoint who is at that particular location and then builds the uh, i mean then builds basically the map of how how long it would take you to reach from your uh, source or from your location to the destination and the way it does is again there are small small sensors in in the end devices which is going to emit that information which is i mean each sensor has a specific now let, what is a sensor right now imagine that um, uh, like um, maybe as human beings right if if someone asks me a question 
what there are only two possibilities i can do right either i know the question i answer or i don't know the question and i don't answer but the most important thing is at least i would respond in almost all the times right i mean if i don't respond it's it's like then i am from a different planet but what i'm trying to tell is like there is a specific attribute which is there in me or in all the human beings and their specific roles or their specific uh, you can say yeah roles where if a specific uh, target or if a specific you know uh, question comes up i would be replying to that so similarly the sensors in the devices have different functionalities like for example in in tv uh, the sensor uh, task would be to give you a real time feed of the where well, of the image or real time feed of that particular location uh, where you have installed the cctv similarly uh, when i gave an example of google maps uh, the functionality of the sensors in your mobile devices is to emit the location of where that device is currently now uh, once the sense once a sensor now there are two things in it once a sensor gives you some information like i said that once i respond the peer who has asked me a question now he needs to interpret what i have replied now again from a, from his perspective either he can understand what i has replied or he doesn't understand anything what i has replied right similarly the sensor would give certain form of information to the controller or to the application where where the mobile is being or where where that particular application is being installed and most of the times either it would be installed on your desktop or or on your mobile phone so it is there is an algorithm which is being fed in in that particular uh, application or the controller to evaluate the information or to interpret the information which is coming from those sensors correct so and as i said that this extends to different verticals now as you can see here that there is an agriculture uh, we use it um, like we now say a smart revolution happening in agriculture where everything is is moving towards iot now again in this particular case what they do is uh, in in the sprinkler system which they which they have right so the, if you see the evolution of agriculture first uh, the human being or first a farmer ne- had to go manually to to uh, water his plants but with the advent of uh, sprinkler system at least those manual tasks were uh, negated or were being reduced because now the sprinkler at least cover the area which it would take him for which it would take him maybe 2 or 3 hours so it is just saving his manual um, hours per day now what they did was in addition to that now they what they do is now they put sensors either close to the sprinkler uh, system where they install which just evaluates the quality of your soil and after evaluating the quality of soil it just emits that information now it is a responsibility of the controller to gauge that information and depending on the algorithm which you have built or depending on the application which you have built it would parse that information and then give a a statistical view to the end user or in this particular case to the farmer that what is the quality of the soil and what does it takes him or what should he do to improve the quality of the soil that's what we call and if if we combine everything right uh, iot apart from internet of things which we already know the acronym of but in depth it basically consists of services data networks and sensors now as i mentioned sensors resides in your actual device so be it your phone, sorry be it your um refrigerator be it your fan or maybe in agriculture be it you know basically it's installed in a sprinkler system which evaluates the quality of the soil or maybe a cctv which which is taking the live feed or maybe on your mobile phones which is tracking or which is getting the location for you and emitting those information 
that has nothing but the role of sensors now what do we mean by networks as i mentioned that sensors need to send that data right now imagine if there was no network imagine there was no wifi or imagine there is no lan how would, how do you think the sensors uh, okay it can interpret the information it can uh, gauge the information but the usability would be modi or would be amplified if that information is passed and interpreted and understood well right now the way information is needs to be shared is through networks now it can be in the form of wifi or lan that's why we say right all the devices gets connected to internet either through fiber in the age of fiber most of the internet connected which we have is wifi no oh, sorry is fiber and with the advent of 5g it's it's still going to be better than what we have now right right so the reason we are moving towards 5g is because the information which is given by the sensors needs to be sent or needs to be received by the controller or the application as soon as possible so that if there is any damage control which is required it can it can be done at just within a fraction of second rather than taking hours to fix that situation so that is what the importance of networks is or basically it is the foundation or basically it is the medium through which the information is shared from the sensors to your application and the information which is shared by the sensors is nothing but a multi million value which is called data because it whatever sensor is going to give you is the real time health of that particular device be it good be or bad that is what that's why uh, there's so much um, different laws which are coming in play right uh, for data because you want to make sure that your data is not exploited because if it is exploited then then you are gone and last but not the least it's a services as i mentioned that each sensor has a specific uh, characteristic assigned to it like if it is in agriculture it has a specific role in that if it is uh, in engine control uh, like in your smart cars we have today right now where where you can determine the health of your engine just through an application so again there are there would be sensors which would be there within your engines which would be giving you the real time health of of the engine and it it would also help that if there is any breakdown you would just come to know before starting your long journey that okay i need to fix this particular problem in my engine and otherwise uh, you know uh, you might face issues while while going for a longer journey so that is what we call services now once we combine all those four things that's when we call iot uh, basically that's what we actually mean uh, by iot because it is connecting my services with the help of uh, networks to the sensors and the most important thing is the application uh, from the sensors i would be getting data on which i would be evaluating the health of that particular device is it clear yes perfect so any i i'm pretty sure that every one of us would be using some kind of an application especially during this covid time right we wouldn't have used uh, swiggy or graph or uh, different applications which would give you daily needs at your doorstep again the, that you won't say iot but what i would say is with the advent of technology you can just order whatever you want just with with the uh, simple click right so that's how it is so i remember i mean few days back i was speaking to my friend and uh, i mean few years back or maybe you know a decade back uh, if uh, what we are discussing was uh, if we had to uh, view a movie right you had to actually stand in a queue maybe two weeks before the release of a film to to get the premium seat which but nowadays um, you don't need that i mean uh, you just go to a particular application and then you know, uh, just as 
select the date on where you want to go and select the premium seat it's so simple right so that's how it it yes with with the way internet is exploring uh, at the same time the life the quality of life is improving and also at the same time we are becoming leisure right i mean you we don't have to simple click and all is done but then later we would understand that yes the life is simple but at the same time what how can it become difficult or if if something normal happens uh, how how you know how you can be affected badly okay so what did we learn so 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 what are the important parameters in iot we learned is there is going to be a sensor which is going to share the information to me there is going to be an application or a controller who is going to fetch those information and do some kind of algorithms and then give you a, a, a human readable format now when i say a human readable format is like say for example uh, like i gave an example of fan right so say for example you want to increase the speed now so the application the moment you select the speed at which you want the fan to rotate the moment you select a particular option from your application the sensor should be able to understand that right that's what we say that so it is basically a communication which is happening between the sensor and the controller and whatever input you give it depends upon the firmware which is running on that right so we we would uh, discuss that more in depth in ble but i'm just giving i'm just giving you i'm just building that foundation so that you start understanding that what are the different components uh, in, in iot because when i uh, started right uh, the only thing which i knew of iot yes anything which is connected to internet is iot that's it but later on when when i started reading more articles when when i started evaluating a few products that's when i realized that oh okay yes it's connected to internet but apart from that there are many new different components which are as equally important as it being connected to internet okay so considering the uh, i would say the challenges now what do you think i mean what do you think what we discussed till now would be the challenges in iot like as i mentioned that imagine a sensor which has been deployed anywhere and is emitting the information the most important thing is the information should be as soon as delivered to the controller uh, so that it can understand it can get the real time health of that particular device and if it needs to take any action it can take at the appropriate time right and also importantly you need to make sure that the information is being shared with the authorized users you don't want to make sure or you don't want to uh, uh, share that information to someone else who who does i mean who whom that information doesn't belong to or or who is not supposed to uh, get that information for example now we almost we every one of us we do digital transactions i mean i am pretty sure uh, every one of us would be doing it so whenever we do any transaction right uh, like before uh, this upi uh, payments came or applications came there was this otp feature which used to come which is also there nowadays uh, but as as a normal let's consider that you are doing a transaction right now as as a end user what do you want you would want that that otp is only delivered to you you don't want that otp to be delivered to your friend right because if he gets to know the otp uh, he is just going to just enter that and either the money would be debited from your account or uh, most of the times it's always debited but sometimes if he wants some amount to be credited he can also do that fun right so you you want to make sure that the authorized users get the share of that information from from the specific sensors right that's where cisco comes with a kinetic uh, model they say where the main mantra of of a kinetic uh, model is that to extract the information 
compute it and deliver it to the authorized user so extraction computation and delivery of the information now so the first thing is extraction right so that's why they have divided that into three verticals which they call the first one as gateway management now what is gateway management basically the information right so okay the sensor once as as we just now saw that iot consists of four different word four different things right it's data network services and sensors so get the information from the sensor now how do you route it how do you make sure that it has the medium which it can go to the end user that's where the gateway management comes in play where it builds the network maybe wireless maybe lan or maybe different protocols uh, so it would build those medium through which the information from the sensor is going to be relayed to your end user or basically to your application wherever it resides now the another important thing is as i mentioned that okay once the information is being extracted from the sensor you want to make sure that the info the information is not being shared to unauthorized users that's why you want to make you want to build a maybe a wall say that okay this is the specific medium where or maybe this is a specific tunnel through which the information would be traversed and only the authorized user would be able to access that information that's what we call that applying the policy for the data in motion to make sure that no malicious actors can extract that information and then cause any sort of you know uh, harm harm to the end user because now let's imagine that you know let, let's consider example of agriculture right so you know, say for example if i am someone who is a competitor to that farmer what i would do is uh, rather than giving him real time feeds of his soil i would just manipulate the data so let's consider that he had to water his soil every 15 days i would just what i would do is i would just do it you know he has to water every 5 months now since the farmer is trusting the data which is coming from the sensor he would say okay my soil is good or maybe the weather is good that's why you know it is taking less water so he might be happy that i am uh, saving the i am saving my water and also at the same time the soil is also good correct but little he knows that the data was being modified while it was in transit that's why uh, that of edge fog monitor they apply the specific policy they also determine that who are those entities who are those trusted actors to which the information needs to be shared and last but not the least the data control module uh, basically controls different edge fog modules and then extracts the information from that and then uh, shares it to any application which which is residing on the cloud or maybe which is residing on the internet to make sure that it is delivered uh, you know securely and also at the same time it has not been modified so that's how the kinetic model resides on basically it has three pillars gateway edge fog and data control and each one has a own roles uh, and and the only motive behind it is to make sure that the data is delivered successfully and there's no this no safely any questions okay uh, any questions perfect uh okay so now since we understood the different challenges right i mean now we understand that okay yes, data is sorry yeah so now we understand that data is something important right uh, data is something which is going to be transmitted from the sensors regularly be it any vertical be it wherever the device is being deployed the main role or the only role for the sensor is to 
send data, right? And we just now saw that what are the different challenges involved while while delivering or while sending that data from the sensor to your controller to to prevent any sort of man in the middle attacks. Now, what we mean by man in the middle attacks is someone should not be modifying the data while it is in transit. So you have to make sure that you apply the policies or you evaluate the security, you make sure you secure, you evolve your security framework such that, that you are protected from this kind of attacks. Okay. Now, before uh, understanding, right? Now, before understanding that, okay, uh, we understand that data is important and before or before thinking about the different kind of attacks which can happen on, on the data transit between the sensors and the controllers, let's deep dive into the what, what would be the actual architecture, which we say the network architecture, right? So I am sure that uh, most of you would be aware of the OSI protocol stack, where each layer, uh, like we have seven layers, and each layer has a specific task role assigned to it and basically it governs that how the data is going to transit or how is the data is going to deliver maybe the client to the end server or maybe it can be an application to your uh, sensor who is residing on your physical device right so as you can see the first layer uh, sir, uh, can you mute uh, if uh, no one is speaking? Yeah, thank you. So uh, the first layer, as you can see, is the embedded systems and sensor. So in a normal network, uh, this equates to uh, the first layer which we have in OSI. Anyone? So, so we have the seven layers in OSI, right? What do you think the embedded systems and sensors can equate to? So uh, the OSI layer, which I'm talking about is the physical layer, data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, and application layer. So what do you think the embedded systems and sensor would relate to? Would it relate to all of the seven layers or would it relate to any one of the layer? Anyone? I know, I mean, uh, this being an afternoon session, you would have had great lunch. And uh, yeah, it, it generally you would be sleepy. Uh, but yeah, you know, that's why that's why I want to make sure that, you know, the, the no one, uh, everyone is alert and at least interactive. You can also put on chat. It's not something that I want the answers on audio. If you're comfortable on putting in chat, please do it. Okay, so uh, so the embedded systems and sensors, right? Uh, these are nothing but your actual device, which are in place, correct? Uh, it As we saw that it can be a CCTV or it can be a, a sensor, which is basically emitting the locations of, of uh, your mobile device. So they are the actual device which are in the field, right? Uh, similar to a physical layer. So basically, if we consider like a router or a switch, which is nothing but an actual black box or an actual box which is located in your network somewhere, maybe in your data center or maybe at your desk or maybe, uh, you know, uh, or maybe in your office, uh, you know, in your office cabin. So that is nothing but your actual device. So that is what we call the physical layer. So that physical layer corresponds to the embedded systems and the sensors layer. So this is where the actual device is going to be located. And in that device, the sensors are going to emit the information. Now the next is the multi-edge service edge, which is nothing but the work or the medium where, through which the data is going to traverse, right? So as you can see that it can be in the form of Wi-Fi, 3G, 4G, or it can also be BLE, right? Or it can also be Zigbee, another one of the IoT protocol. 
um, or it can also be maybe MPLS, which in a normal traditional network you would have heard of, right? So those are the different protocols which would be working in this layer to route your data from your sensors to the end application. And as I mentioned, that core is nothing but so the layer which you see of the multi-service edge, right? That is nothing but your distribution layer, right? So, or I can say that that is your edge layer. Edge is nothing but so let's consider that your sensor is residing in your house, right? And uh, I am like I am maybe say uh, hundred kilometers far from from that particular uh, device which is located in my house and still i need to evaluate or still i need to see how it is behaving so there would be a, a router uh, there would be an edge router which you can think of of your normal uh, internet uh, home internet router which you use right to access the internet if you are using wifi so what it would do is uh, basically it's nothing but the edge router which uh, through which you are able to connect to Wi-Fi, right? So the sensor which is sitting in your house is now going to share that information over Wi-Fi to that router, which is nothing but your edge router. Now that edge router would now be sharing the information to your core. Now, uh, we when we use internet at home, we use one of the providers, be it Geo, be it Airtel, be it Vodafone, right? So each of these providers have that dedicated data centers, which we say a core network or we say a core data center where all the traffic from different nodes or different edge routers come come to them and then the core router delivers the data to the specific application which is hosted in that specific location so imagine this so what i uh, uh, reiterating on the example which I gave, like for example, there is a sensor which is sitting in my home. It can be, uh, let's assume that it is just giving me the live feed of my uh, home, right? So it gets that information, gives it to my edge router. Edge router gets it, now goes, uh, gives it over the Wi Fi to the core router, which maybe let's consider that I'm using internet from Airtel. So it goes to the core data center of Airtel. Now, from there, it determines that where I'm located. Now, since I'm 100 kilometers far, it just selects the appropriate path or it determines that, okay, which is the best path to deliver this data. And then it delivers that data to the application which is being hosted or which is being installed in my phone. That's what we call the cloud management, right? That Generally, uh, I just gave an example of, of an end user, but generally uh, you would have different applications residing on your cloud. The most uh, simple example which I can give is, is the weather detection model, right? Uh, like for example, nowadays you can uh, determine what is the weather going to be like for maybe next five days for, for a country, uh, which for a country where, where we are not part of, like for example, you want to, want to see what's the weather for, for a particular country for next five days. It could be anything, right? So that's how, so the way it, the way that application, like it's, yes, it's a Google application, uh, which gives you the weather alerts, but the way it's able to gauge that information is because it's getting the information from the actual sensors who are in the field. And through that, it is giving you an information, even if you are located like several miles far. The reason it is able to do it because there is an application, although their application would be in a cloud to that particular country, we have the uh, fiber connectivity or the internet connectivity. The information, say, from US is easily being transferred to India or being routed to India, and you can see the information almost live, right? So that's what we call, that's why we segregate this uh, IoT architecture in form of devices, edge connectivity, then there is a core connectivity, and last but not the least, the actual applications, which resides on the cloud. Okay. But again, 
Okay, uh, I understand that that's the problem, but again, uh, the question remains as why it's important to to secure you know the IoT you know, space. Uh, now, one of according to one of the report, or you can see here also, right, that the usage, the utilities of of the IoT devices is increasing rapidly. Like, as you can see that by 2020, this is a number, but I'm pretty sure that for in next two or three years, it's just going to be you know four times of this or five times of this. And the most important problem in IoT is there's no standard framework. Yes. When we talk about the framework which we just now saw, Kinetic, or there's another framework called MUD from. They are trying to streamline the way the IoT devices can onboard, right? But again, the way the different vendors use that particular stack, or if I take an example of BLE, the way the different vendors use the BLE stack is again different. So say, for example, a vendor X has used 10 features on the BLE stack, the other vendor would just be using two. So you cannot control that, uh, uh, that you cannot control the manufacturing or you cannot tell the vendor that, you know, why did you use only two features? It's only that after you onboard that device and then actually evaluate, try to evaluate that device and determining the policies, that's when you understand, okay, you know, uh, this particular device has just used uh, only two features rather than he was supposed to use 10 features. So that's where that in that's where Cisco or different uh, vendors or different competitors are coming up with, with different onboarding solutions where MUD is one of the um, IETF standard uh, accepted framework to onboard your IoT devices, right? So where, where it, if before the devices comes into play, it just evaluates that what are the different security features it has been enabled. And the example which I gave, right, that a particular vendor has just used 10, uh, two features of a of BLE stack rather than using 10, it would just highlight to that particular vendor that you're, you're just using two features of that particular of BLE stack and you are, your network, wherever you deploy this device, it's going to be vulnerable. So before you onboard or before you deploy, make sure you uh, install or make sure you modify your firmware to include all those features so that you're not vulnerable to uh, different attacks. That's where the onboarding solutions happen. And that's where uh, you know the, the solution which we talked about, the kinetic framework, that's where it helps that basically before actually uh, starting to apply the policies for the data in transit, it also onboards your devices. It also does the security checks to determine that what can be, what are the what are the loopholes in your system and what can you do to, to prevent it before it starts emitting data. So that's why it's, it's one of the most important thing uh, to provide security to IoT devices worldwide. And also at the same time, it is a challenging task also. So as I mentioned, one of the challenges is as I that day on day or daily, right? Uh, there are many new devices which come in place, uh, right? And there are different protocols. Yes, um, currently IoT works. I mean, there was Zigbee, BLE, now there's LoWAN, another protocol. So different coming and then there are new devices which basically use that protocol right again uh, there is a particular uh, framework to example in BLE right there is a uh, guideline so when you when you look uh, so there is a guideline of what we say the RFC document right in a traditional networking world few years back so you have this implementation document of from BLE, uh, like the most recent version is 5.2. And there's like 3000 pages of that document, right? Which, which tells you that, you know, you need to implement, you need to have the security features, you need to build your framework like this. But as I mentioned that as a vendor, I can always choose which features I want and I can ignore another features because if I implement big, all the features, the cost also goes high, right? So as a vendor or as a manufacturing vendor, I need to make that call. 
So the challenge is new devices coming up, new devices building the framework in different ways. And also the most important thing is there are different protocols which keep on coming. Like, for example, there is a device which has been built on Lowan, right? So first you need to understand that how Lowan works. Uh, first you need to, and once you understand how Lowan works, then only you are going to build the policies for that. Then only you are going to determine that, okay, what should be my inbound rule? What should be my outbound rule? On which uh, date or maybe on which particular protocols the communication is going to happen all that stuff right so as as a uh, network administrator the onboarding also becomes a challenge and most importantly how do you gauge the information which is coming from that particular device yes you know that that device is supposed to do a particular functionality but how do you evaluate the information how do you understand yes you have ready-made applications available from the devices but how do you understand that what the, what that value corresponds to? So that is what the challenge becomes to network uh, to to the net, network administrators, where they need to keep on learning new protocols and also at the same time how the communication works. Because well, when when we talk of IoT attacks, right, there are two forms of attack software and hardware yes but there are two forms of attacks which can happen either at the protocol where it shares the information or it can happen at the hardware itself and when i say on the hardware itself it can either be on the firmware or it can be another form of attack which which we would see uh, in, in next slides but those are the challenges which which come so you are always evolving yourself like like 10 years down the line, if someone asked you for OSI network layer, you are pretty sure that yeah, any network device which comes, it's going to perf it's going to function between the seven layers. But when I ask when when in today's world, when someone asks you for, you know, can you work on a new IoT device? The answer would be yes. I would be able to understand, but I won't be confident in configuring those policies because uh, there as I mentioned, that each vendor interprets the data sheet differently because uh, there could be numerous challenges like cost or other uh, variations, right? So that's that's where the challenge comes. So that's why you see this different frameworks like Kinetic or Cisco Smart, where where it tries to help you in in solving those challenges by doing by automating your onboarding process and also at the same time giving you a real time uh, statistics that what is missing and what needs to be added. Okay, so just summarizing that, so the challenges would be the visibility. As I mentioned that uh, as new devices keep on coming, you first need to understand that what that device characteristic or what that device service is supposed to do. And the data which you see from that particular device or from that sensors what it is how how you should be interpreting that data yes your application would be there uh, to give you the data but still as an end user you need to read that information and make some sense out of that so that is one challenge when we say visibility the other is the intent based policy as i mentioned that we want to understand the behavior of the devices what it is going to do at what rate it is going to send the data or maybe what is the encryption in that data or uh, you want to make sure that who should access that data, right? Uh, that is also important as we discussed that, okay, once the data has came out, uh, how, do you, how do you make sure that the data is to the trusted parties? And as I mentioned that currently, there is no standard of connecting IoT device to enterprise network. That's where there's different models like Kinetic, and Cisco Mud helps you in onboarding your IoT devices to your enterprise network. Any questions? I know uh, there's been too much theory, but the most interesting part now would start coming up once when we start uh, discussing on BLE. But I just wanted to make sure that this particular IoT, I mean, not exactly IoT uh, framework, but the IoT how, the IoT architecture, and what are the different uh, terminologies involved in it. So, 
I hope it has been clear till now. Yeah, actually, Bhavik, uh, they must uh, know. Uh, in fact, all of us know what are the standard framework, industrial standards, the way, the structured way to integrate uh, devices with the network, ensuring that the whole end-to-end solution is flawless. So this was all very important. This is really very, very important. So please go ahead. Thank Perfect. you. Yeah. So. Uh, I have like two slides after then we would break out. So before BLE starts, right, we would just take a break so that I just want to make sure that, you know, then there is some, that at least there is some time for them to just gauge what has been uh, discussed till now. Okay. Perfect. So we talked about IoT attacks or IoT security challenges, different things, right? Now, these are the different kinds of attacks. Uh, which you can see in, in normally. Normally, you would see this kind of attacks in an IoT world. And not only in IoT world, in a normal network, right? You would see this kind of attacks. Um, the first is reconnaissance. Now, what do you mean by reconnaissance, right? Reconnaissance is a phase. Uh, how many of you know Nmap? Maybe, uh, I mean, you can just give a thumbs up. On, on the chat, or uh, I'm sure uh, you would have heard about Nmap. Even if you have not heard, uh, it's something that after the session, you can always have a look. So what Nmap helps you is, it's just a tool which tells you 10 different things, which what is happening in your network. Now, when you say a network, it means you need to give uh, some data to that tool. I mean, and when I run that tool, right, Nmap. Yeah. So there is an input which is required, which would be in the form of an IP address. That's considered in server. Uh, so you want to understand that what this server is capable of. Yeah? It can be an important server, uh, maybe in your IT network, which holds the data of all your uh, students, right? So what I would do is I would just do Nmap and the IP address of that server. Now, the response which I would get is, what are the different protocols it can listen on? Or what are the different services it can listen on? When I say services, is it HTTP? Is it HTTPS? Is it uh, uh, port or is it port 8080? So those are the uh, information you would get from Nmap. But most importantly, that is called the reconnaissance phase, where to try to understand that what the system is doing from a bird's eye view. So before launching an attack, you want to understand how the system is behaving, right? For example, uh, when when we uh, go to airport, right? We have a strict protocols which we have to follow, right? So first you need to get the boarding pass, then you need to get the your luggage being checked, and then you uh, get a chance to go in the aircraft, right? So what that has been, so if you look from a uh, security perspective, they are not doing nothing but a reconnaissance where they are trying to understand, they are trying to determine that whoever is boarding the flight is not doing something fishy or is not carrying something fishy, which is not being allowed, right? So the different checks which we do is nothing but the reconnaissance phase from the airport authority perspective. Similarly, uh, when you are doing any security checks on any network, you would do this reconnaissance to understand that, okay, what are the different services? Why it is important to understand that on which services it communicates to? Because those are, those are the mediums through which you would be communicating to that device. Now let's assume that uh, there is no HTTPS, right? Uh, if there is no HTTPS, how we are going to communicate to that particular network? Mm, yeah, because you are not, so it's not something that you are going to connect a console or uh, or you are just going to take that device and bring it to your uh, desk, right? It's not going to happen like that. So the device would be remote and you, even if you are like uh, thousand kilometers far, you still want to understand that I mean, 1,000 kilometers was just an example. <laughs> but but in your IT network, right, uh, since you would be within your LAN, you can always, maybe in from your hostel room, you can still do a Nmap uh, from, 
with the help of the ip which you have for that server understand that which are the services happening or on which services it is communicating then you start uh, determining that is the server susceptible to any kind of attack now here i just gave an example of fragmentation attack where say through that reconnaissance phase you come to know that a server is only capable of handling 500 bytes of data at a time just an example so what you would do is uh, you would try to launch an attack while sending say 2000 bytes of data at a single go maybe you would share some huge file to the server and you just see that you know is it able to handle those file uh, those data if not the only thing it can happen is either it can tell you that i am not able to handle this or it handles it and then it crashes right so that is some kind of attack because now if it crashes it means the server firmware or whatever operating system is running on the server there is no validation check there being applied that if a data is being sent more than 500 bytes there is no there's no uh, secure mechanism being built there that you know if there's more than 500 bytes of data it should just be responding that you know uh, i mean it should just to it should not acknowledge that data but if that kind of validation check is not happened there is very much possibility that it might crash right so that is one kind of attack which you have done another is sniffing sniffing which you what do you mean by uh, sniffing as i mentioned that sniffing is like understanding or uh, listening to what communication is happening between client and the server like sniffing and man in the middle go hand in hand right so as i mentioned that uh, the example which i gave uh, one of your friend is doing a transaction a bank transaction and the otp which he listens or which he gets from uh, in his phone what if if you are able to intercept that what if before it was received by your uh, friend you are able to uh, un- get that four digit otp and you are able to play with that that is what we call sniffing and also man in the middle and man in the middle attacks is basically once you have sniffed what is happening between them then you think of different ways of how you can modify the data or you can or at the same time you can do some kind of replay attacks where you have modified the data but also at the same time you are making sure that the end device is also affected where you just add some kind of malware and make sure that the end device is behaving you know abnormally so that's what we call man in the middle attacks so the question remains is then how to secure right uh, this is in general about a iot device and this is a framework which has been given by uh, cisco where what they say is or is uh, to each of the vendor is that these are the four fundamentals which one should have in all the devices the first is authentication now why authentication is important i'm pretty sure each of us use uh, laptops or pcs or desktops at offices colleges or homes right and each of us has an authentication to to the laptop or the windows pc why because we want to make sure that whatever data is being saved in that device is not being accessed by some third party uh, or some by some unauthorized user who does not have privileges to access that system that's why you give an authentication right because you want to make sure that the user who has the authentication capability or who has the account created in that particular device is only able to access it that's what we call authentication similarly in iot devices uh, when i mentioned that an application speaks to a sensor right or it speaks to a device there is actually a pairing process which you just see in few slides there is actually a pairing process which happens before the actual communication happens and that pairing process happens through authentication because you want to make sure that the application is being installed on a trusted user and he and you want to also make sure that the data which is being extracted from the server is being sent to the uh, authorized user that is why authentication is important what do we mean by authorization you need to make sure that 
once a data is being accessed by the specific trusted party right now what i mean by trusted party for example in your colleges right uh, you we all write exams what if if um, you know the answer the answer sheet uh, which is uh, has to be evaluated by the respected professor um, goes in some different i mean is being evaluated by someone else who, who does not know abc of of that particular subject but still that uh, particular answer sheet uh, which was written by the student uh, went to that professor and you know he can just without evaluating he can just tell that he got 100 on 100 so you need to make sure that those answer sheets are delivered to the respected professor who is who has a know of the who knows that subject and also at the same time who has the authority to evaluate those answer sheets similarly if we talk in the iot space right now we all use uh, cars right now nowadays there are smart cars coming in play now generally there is a trust relationship between the car vendor and the actual car right now imagine that there is a uh, 10 different hyundai cars and there is a vendor application which is being installed on on say one of the user like i own one of the hyundai car and similarly there are 10 owners of the 10 different hyundai cars right now the kind of information which would be shared between the hyundai car i own and between my application which is installed on my phone would be different to the information which is shared between two hyundai cars right because what is the similarity between two different hyundai cars they are from the same manufacturer and they have the same make and let's assume that they are of the same model right so the kind of information which would be shared between them would be different to what would be shared with the end user who owns that actual car that's what we call authorization making sure that the right kind of data goes to a right set of people and the last but not the least uh, the third step is the network enforce policy as i mentioned you apply the policy while the data is in transit so that the data is being delivered to the trusted authority and not to some malicious actors and last but not the least the secure analytics is the visibility and control is nothing but the application where you see the different statistics like the example which i gave for a car on a end user or let's consider my phone uh, who, since i own that hyundai car on my the application of the hyundai would show me the statistics of my engine maybe the statistics of my ac which it help me to evaluate that when is the service required or maybe the application can just give me a notification that you know now your car needs a service so that is kind of analytics which it did with the help of the algorithm which was built on the application but most importantly the way it built that information is through the data which was being emitted from from the sensors which are fitted in my car is this clear so it's authentication authorization then you have network enforce policy and then you have analytics where you do the actual statistics on the end application any questions on this no sir okay perfect so now time is 325 Three thirty. Sorry. Okay. So, uh, sir, uh, we take a break of five minutes because after this, I would start with daily. So, I just want to make sure that we go in a one flow. Is that fine, or we want a break of ten minutes? Five minutes is enough, sir. Okay. Perfect. So, we meet currently. It's three thirty, right? So, we meet at three thirty-five. Perfect. Okay, sir. Okay. Perfect.
ओके यस थ्री थर्टी फाइव एंड स्पेड फॉर अनदर मिनट्स Okay. Uh, shall we start? So, uh, we right? Yes, sir. Okay. Perfect. So, let's start. So, till now we have what what to architecture um, and what are different challenges involved and what are different solutions in place currently right uh, like from cisco and different vendors to onboard the iot devices now let's 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 uh, deep dive into one of the protocol which is widely used in an iot space and we would also under we would also see that why it is widely used what is so special about it right so as you can see that uh, the BLE is basically derived from the classic Bluetooth, which which was in place before the IoT uh, world was was uh, you know uh, explored, right? So the Bluetooth classic. So what's what's the difference between Bluetooth and Bluetooth uh, low energy? As a name signifies, Bluetooth low energy is basically it is meant for devices which has low power. or which has low battery backup as compared to a traditional bluetooth classic because a traditional bluetooth classic was was meant to transfer larger files like so we uh, do do uh, in wifi for example right so but uh, the bluetooth classic was not uh, friendly uh, was was not meant for uh, devices which had low power right or which did not had a uh, high battery backup and as you can see that it is being also called as bluetooth smart and you know the bli started from 4.0 specification currently um, the new devices which you take the most recent bli version is 5.2 and the oldest is 4.0 okay but i i guess most of the devices still use 4.2 but yeah each bluetooth feature or each ple feature has some modifications than the previous one now let's understand that why uh, ble is i mean how, why why ble is used widely in iot space right so why can't i use bluetooth classic or uh, why i have to use a ble protocol stack the reason being is uh, as i mentioned that the ble is meant for low energy devices now when you look on all the iot devices right one of the challenge apart yeah even your phone is a iot device but if you look for uh, the different verticals we talked about or the say for example the sensors now the devices which are used in agriculture to determine the quality of the soil right now you cannot expect that devices to have a power backup 24 by 7 right i mean uh, in in a ideal case so you want to have that device to run without power uh, maybe uh, at least maybe for 6 months or 8 months so that you have the capability of charging every uh, at regular intervals right so you need to make sure that the devices are capable of uh, working without the power because understand the various like that the sensor is supposed to share the data and when it is going to share the data it is also going to consume battery right because uh, it's it, uh, it's not just going to share the data uh, the only way it can share the data is when it is up and running and the when it as it emits more and more information obviously the battery is going to drain right so most that's why most of the iot devices right it's it's like the sensors are so small and you want to make sure the circuit is so compact 
and also at the same time have have a good battery backup right obviously you can charge the devices or you can have external power source but without that you want to make sure that the device runs on itself without you know external power source that's why uh, ble is much more uh, you know is much more uh, gaining momentum in iot space because it is capable i mean the ble protocol stack is capable of of uh, being built on devices which requires minimum power in terms of external charging and also at the same time share the information what you want right okay so let's understand what is a ble architecture you know as you can see that there are three basically classifications controller host and apps okay now what is uh, let's start from down to top now in the controller what do you see is nothing but the physical layer now as we saw in the previous slides also what is physical layer basically the layer at which the your actual device resides now when when is right consider a mobile phone you always have a ble radio inside it right uh, what is a radio basically it is the medium through which basically your hardware through which the ble signals would be transmitted right so that is nothing but your physical layer the radio at which your device is going to communicate on ble okay now before that ble is is nothing but a frequency hopping uh, protocol what do you mean by frequency hopping protocol basically there is a band of frequency on which it works which is 2.4 megahertz and there are different channels in it which you would see in in just few slides but uh, just understand that it's just a frequency hopping protocol where it works on different frequencies and then interacts with your application and shares uh, the information at the same time right so the ble radio is nothing but it would be working on those frequencies and emitting the information now what is link layer link layer is nothing but similar to your data link layer on the osi layer it is nothing but the layer which abstracts all the information from the top layer top layer i mean host or apps with the help of the host controller interface and puts it in 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 the link layer header and then shares it to your uh, peers or uh, end device who wants to receive those information now what is logical link control uh, adaptation layer is nothing but similar to your session layer in osi layer model like your tcp and udp where you need those medium where the data transfer is going to happen like if you see in tcp or udp there are ports on which the communication happen right be it https or be it your ftp file transfer all communicate on ports similarly in logical link control layer there is no ports but the header is abstracted such that all the information is basically from the top layer is being put in the logical link layer and then sent it downwards and basically the host controller interface then with the help of hci commands which is called host controller interface commands extracts that information and gives it to the radio or the radio gives the information to host controller interface it sends the information to the logical link controller layer and then it sends it to the uh, upper layer so it's like in both the directions okay now before we uh, focus on attribute protocol right the most important thing like if you would have seen in a traditional network right uh, routers which is you have an ip address right uh, so what is an ip address basically it is the identity of that uh, pc or that device through which the either the information would be sent to the server or it would be the uh, ip on which the information would be received correct because if you don't have an ip address basically you cannot you know uh, communicate with anyone right you are just a dumb device with, with no connectivity out, with the outside world now the question is do we have an ip address in bli the answer is no why because as i mentioned that 
it has to reside on a low energy it has to conserve the energy as low as possible so what they did was rather than having an ip address the identity in ble is the mac address the 48 bit mac address which we have in a normal traditional router or switch right uh, along with the ip address we also have the mac address so in ble whichever devices uh support ble they have a unique identification of the identity is in terms of the mac address which is there which is 48 bit in your phone right uh, when when you uh, go about the phone uh, when you see that you would see the ble mac address which is being advertised so you can always determine that okay what is a ble mac address to which you, you are going to communicate with the peer so in all your communication the only information which you see at the link layer is going to be your mac address there is no concept of ip address okay now what do we mean by attribute protocol now in ble basically the way the, so the way the data is being defined right so let me come from generic access profile to attribute protocol that would make sense so what do we mean by generic access profile now in ble each device is being defined a specific role okay so like your phone would be a client and your let's consider that it's your fitband device right now the your fitband device is going to be a server why because a fitband device is going to share you all the information related to your health be it your heartbeat rate be it your blood pressure or be it how many uh, steps you have run right so that is nothing but your server now so the role is being defined by the generic access profile or it's just basically in the functionality of generic access profile is to determine who is going to be the client and who is going to be the server and the way it defines the way it determines as to parameters in the ble stack because it evaluates that okay it is going to share this information it means it is this server and this application has nothing to share with me or uh, it has nothing to share with anyone else it's going to be the client right now what is generic attribute profile now in ble as i mentioned that this is your fitband device now what is the service it's going to provide generally what what do you think the fitband device the service it provides all the health related services and now when i say services means not the actual health related service but all all the information regarding your heartbeat blood pressure other things right so that is nothing but your so all those services right so health related services under that health so let's consider health related service as your class and under that class there are different functions one is the heart rate other is the blood pressure other is the number of steps uh, you, uh, you you walk and maybe another one is the fat loss which we you know nowadays we focus more right so let's consider that under that class these are the four functions now what were the four functions heart rate blood pressure how many steps steps you walked and fat loss now these functions are nothing but the attributes okay so attributes is nothing but the unique service or the unique function which is there under that health related service and each attribute would be assigned a specific 16 digit uid number by the attribute protocol so the attribute protocol role is that how it just determines how many functions are there under that service and just assigns a unique um, 16 digit identification number to each of this function so would be it the how many steps you ran or the fat loss or heart rate or blood pressure so that each unique uh, identification number would be given by attribute protocol and what is the role of security manager security manager uh, basically determines all the security parameters whether the uh, data transfer has to be encrypted or it has to be non encrypted so those different flags would be st stored in in the security manager from there it comes to know from there uh, basically the application comes to know that how it needs to communicate to the device 
and also at the same time how would it expect the data to come from the device to itself right so that is where uh, all those security parameters are being defined as a security manager and last but not the least the apps or the applications are nothing but the uh, actually reside on your mobile phone or end pc to which uh, it it intercepts the data from the sensors and provides you the statistics okay so before uh, we move to the next slide is this clear i would just repeat one more time what what are the attributes because that is generally con uh, confusing right when when first time you you see uh, ble so as i mentioned that each device is going to perform a specific kind of task right so like a fitband device is going to give you health related data so let's assume that the fitband device has a health related services and under that health related services there are four functions heart rate blood pressure steps uh, walked and uh, the fat loss now each of this functions would be classified as attribute by the attribute protocol and would be given a 16 digit identification number okay is this clear any questions No sir, no questions. Oh, perfect. Sir, what's the difference between generic access profile and generic access profile? Yeah, so generic, yeah, so generic access profile, right? As I mentioned, it just defines the roles. Who is the client? Who is the server? Like that's it. That's its uh, functionality. So as I mentioned, that uh, between your mobile phone and the Fitband device, mobile phone would be your client. Uh, Fitband device would be your server. that's it that's what it defines a role and the way it defines it's basically it reads this the different attributes which that device uh, would evaluate so where, like in fitband device the attribute field would not be empty right because it would be providing you that different attributes like heart rate blood pressure but in an application the attribute field would be empty so the gap profile would just see that okay the attribute field is empty in my mobile phone application so that would work as client and since the attribute field is not empty in in a fitband device that works as a server that's it otherwise it does not have any importance apart from uh, giving giving the roles okay does does that answer your question okay now the most important part right uh, how does the pairing happen now what do you mean by pairing uh uh into different mobiles or bluetooth uh, to share some data and the way we pair is first we enable the bluetooth and uh, then we see the list of devices which are in the vicinity and then we connect to one of the device right and then we get paired so that's how the pairing process is in ble now let's assume that there is a mobile user uh, there is an application which is installed on the mobile and there is a, in this case it's a blood pressure monitor device right or let's consider it's a fitband device anything you can think of now as you can see the first thing uh, the ble device would do is it would keep on sending advertisements so the moment you enable your ble radio uh, or the moment you enable bluetooth right be it your mobile device be it any device what it does is it basically sends advertisements at every regular interval which is being defined in the ble stack so as part of 5.2 the interval is 15 milliseconds so every 15 milliseconds it would advertise okay but what it would send in those advertisements the thing which it sends in at advertisement is the 48 bit mac address that's it so uh, in advertisements it would just keep on sending the mac address and also some other information it could be the location specific 
let's consider that you know as i mentioned that a sensor which is there in your mobile device which whose functionality is just to emit location of where that device is is currently in place so in advertisements it will just send the mac address and the location that's it now scan request is something which would come from the client right so as a user uh, so ble is like works in 30 meter range right so let's imagine that this uh, blood pressure monitor or uh, the slave or this fitband device is advertising itself now if your mobile is within that vicinity it would just read those uh, uh, different advertisements which would be in the form of mac address in in your uh, application right because the moment you enable the bluetooth you would have seen right there are different device names which comes that is nothing but the scan request which the application did like it just internally did a query for all the ble devices which are in my vicinity correct now now after that what you do is the moment you send a scan request how you do it is basically you just press on one of the uh, mac address or one of the device on where you want to connect to and then you get a scan response where the um, that particular device like in this case pressure blood pressure monitor or a fitband device responds you that okay you are uh, going to connect to me uh okay i acknowledge that after that there is a connection request which comes from the master to say because the reason you want to connect to that device because you want to interact to that device right uh, you want to get different information like whatever examples uh, which we discussed before be it your um, smart fan or be it your smart refrigerator you want to see like in smart refrigerator you want to see that what is a cooling temperature uh, uh, if you want to modify the cooling temperature you first need to connect to that device right so that is the connection request now once the connection request is being sent to this uh, so in this case as you can see the master and slave and the names are used interchangeably like client or server or master and slave right so yeah the terminology are used interchangeably but Uh, the most important part is uh, to understand that how how the exchange happens so once a connection request is sent by the master right or be by the application to the end device then there is a pr- pairing process which happens now basically what happens in pairing process so uh, when there is a pairing process right so uh, the connection request the slave ask that uh, whether you want to pair with me that is what you call pairing process now what is being exchanged in where what do you want to pair with me basically in that ble stack it determines the different parameters which it wants like the blood pressure monitor wants that the pairing should be encrypted right uh, encrypted when i mean is basically there should be some kind of authentication key uh, which should be input only then you can connect to me right it's similar to we uh, entering uh, sim- if we want to log into our desktop we enter a username password right similarly here the way the ble protocol stack is being defined in that particular device wants the user to put a specific key only after which it can uh, connect to that right that is what we call encryption right so there are only two possibilities uh either the pairing process is clear text or the pairing process is encrypted now let's assume that in this case the fitband device says that it should be encrypted so there are different flags uh, which are being shared in in uh, the ble uh, headers where it says the uh, pairing process should be encrypted now what after which what happens is basically both of them exchange their ecdh key i'm sure uh, today's crypto session you would have learned something about crypto and different protocols being placed and how how the data is encrypted so in this particular case the moment the pairing is defined as encrypted there are public keys which are being shared by both the both of them to each other and on the basis of that there is a six digit or generally six to eight digit nonce which is created or you can see a six digit value which is created which would be 
send which would be sent as a message to your mobile with the help of your application which is installed right the moment you enter that six digit or eight digit whatever uh, value you got in the message right you get connected to the blood pressure monitor and understand that this communication the public key exchange is is all encrypted with the help of aes cipher so even if there is any man in the middle which is happening you cannot determine that what is getting exchanged between so the key has been exchanged uh, the application is able to connect to the device now after which right um, the data exchange happens now during the data exchange right uh, there is one process called bonding bonding is nothing but to uh, keep the device uh, whether you want to trust this device for longer time so even for that case during this data communication exchange right there are different flags for bonding If that particular flag is set it means it wants to bond this device which means that this blood pressure monitor wants to trust this device now one of the advantages of bonding is that even if the connection is broken right so bluetooth bli connection is very short lived at the max you would have one minute uh, connectivity in the master and slave after which it has to reconnect and get the information after which it has to reconnect and get the information depends on the ble stack which is being developed like generally in a health monitor generally the devices which are installed in health departments they generally have a longer connectivity for the connections right uh so how does a bonding helps us basically if there is a trust relationship being built between uh, the application and the device the next time when the connection is disconnected in the advertisement phase it would just tell that okay uh, it would just specify in the advertisement that this is the mac address which needs to connect to me and uh, because i knew the mac address during the pairing process so it knows that to which so basically in the bonding table there is is a mac address to which it has built a trust relationship so when a new connection needs to be built or when a new advertisement needs to be sent it just sends to that specific mac address rather than broadcasting it to everyone that's the only advantage of uh, bonding so each of this process is in depth but i just didn't want it to overload uh, with too many information but this is the gist that sends the advertisement there is a scanning request there is a scanning response then there is a connection request after which there is an actual pairing process where you uh, where you basically the application connects your device with the help of the uh, value which is created and the way the value is created is with the help of the public key which is exchanged between both of them and once the pairing is successful all your uh, communication is encrypted make sense okay so as i mentioned that the ble is is a frequency hopping uh, protocol what do i mean by that now we have already seen that there is a advertisement which happens at the start which emits the mac address it could also emit the location depending on what is the functionality of that device or what is the functionality of the sensor in that device right now as you can see that there are 40 such channels now and it lies between the 2.4 megahertz range now as you can see that the advertisement channel uses the advertisement phase basically uses three channels from this three fixed channels okay so to just keep on advertising on only on those three channels and the secondary channel is nothing but the advertisement or the data channel works on the other 37 channels so it can just emit the data on any of those 37 channels that's why we call frequency hopping because it just hops between those 37 frequencies is it clear till now okay now as i mentioned the device roles right who, uh, who assigns us device roles the gap generic access profile right so as you can see that the client is nothing but the mobile phone on which the application is being installed basically it wants a data that's why it is called the central as you can see the name interchanges sometimes it called client sometimes called master sometimes called central 
but the 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 simplest thing to remember is whoever wants the data it's nothing is the client and who has the data which is nothing but the fit band device or you know blood pressure monitor device is the server okay so this is how the roles which are being defined now as we discuss attribute protocol is nothing but the who defines who basically uh, for each attribute so as we saw that there were four different functions for that fit band device be it heart pressure sorry uh, heart rate blood pressure um, the number of steps and uh, you know, fat loss so basically what does attribute protocol does is basically it de it defines a 16 digit uid number for each of those uh, functions or we say attributes in the ble uh, terminology that's it that's what it it the functionality of attribute protocol is now as you can see that um, as i mentioned that the advertising interval there is a specific advertising interval at which the data keeps on advertising itself uh, as per 5.2 ble it's 15 milliseconds so as you can see that this is a peripheral which is nothing but your fit band device it keeps on advertising at a specific rate and then with mobile application then sends a scan request once it listens to the advertising data so this keeps on repeating in finite times i mean every 15 milliseconds you would see this process keep on happening the slave device which is nothing but your fit band or blood pressure monitor device or any device any iot device basically keeps on advertising itself and if the client wants to connect to it it sends a scan request and and a scan response from from the uh, peripheral device or or the fit band device okay now as we discuss about the attribute right what was a generic attribute profile basically it it is the main data source for for a ble device i mean if you want to exploit the device or if you want to evaluate uh, the security parameters right uh, of of that uh, ble device you would be focusing one of the things you would be focusing uh, is on generic attribute profile why because it stores all your information what the data the device is going to give to you so as you can see that it is basically basically classified as services so as we saw that what is a service service is nothing but the different services the hard, uh, the particular device is going to give like for example a fit band device is going to give a service on heart related services right um, so i mean health related services sorry um, so that is nothing but a service a now what is a under service a what are what did we discuss what it holds what what information it gives heart rate blood pressure that is nothing but your characteristic or your attributes like characteristic or attributes are change uh, use interchangeably so let's assume that the first one which you see here right that is let's say it's a heart rate uh, characteristic or a heart rate attribute now it would have a value to it correct so when you have an heart rate you have some value between 0 to 100 right so that is nothing but the value and the descriptor is nothing but the permissions you have on those uh, values like you have a read write permission or you have a only read permission now what are these permissions for what do you think right uh, basically this permissions are for the controller or the application which is installed on a mobile phone can he modify those values right so ideally you won't want you do not want a heart rate values to be modified correct generally you want it to be a read only value where it should not be modified and it should only be emitted by the sensor that is what you see in descriptor so this is how the data is being stored in generic service under that there are values and descriptors are nothing but the permissions you have like read write or both read write like that so this is how it looks like so as you can see it's a heart rate service under that there is a uid 
as i mentioned that uid is nothing but a 16 digit unique number given by the attribute protocol and under each service you have a specific handle for that characteristic now say for example this is heart rate uh, for that there would be a specific handle it can be any uh, hexadecimal number and uh, uid would be a 16 digit you right and and as i mentioned that this comes under descriptor whether it has a read write uh, value permissions or read values and other stuff so this is how the data looks like i mean this is how the data looks like under gat uh, attribute it is being classified as services and then uh, under services the characteristics or attributes and each characteristic would have a specific handle and also a 16 digit unique identification number which is given by attribute protocol and most importantly the value and also what permissions you have whether you have read write or only read permissions because there would be some attributes where you want a read write where you want the application to also modify like for example you know certain critical values which the application can also reset right so that is where you would have a read write permissions being given to that particular characteristic and this is what the attacker would try to exploit that if he gets any read write permissions it would try to uh, uh, modify that value uh, and and try to exploit that so you know that's that's why i said that this is one of the important parameter which an as an attacker you would also look for and also as a security analyst you would look for so any questions till now i think this is very important so any question feel free to ask all clear any questions okay i hope uh, it's clear right okay okay now let's focus on the connection flow okay um so this is the actual uh, so what i did was uh, i actually bought a fitband device this is a cheap one right so generally when we buy devices we always look for cheap uh which is cheap right on on the amazon platforms or any any um uh, flipkart or anything else but we never evaluate this from a security perspective we all, always see that okay if it is cheap that's what best for me so in this particular case uh what i did was uh i purchased this fitband device and i installed it uh, the application for that fitband device to my phone okay we saw that um, the phone starts scanning for the advertisement and at the same time this uh, fitband device also advertises itself now in advertisement you would either see the mac address or the uh, location also if if uh, that is being also sent as part of the advertisement channel now the phone receives the advertisement it just stops scanning and it just sends a connect request to to the fitband device right so uh, we would do that right so once we know that this is the mac address of the ble device on which i want to connect i would just press a connect to that and after that the pairing process happens which we just discussed and further communication happens to the fitband device okay so all good then what was the problem with this i identified right let's see that okay i would just take i think i would discuss this later so let me show you the lab guide right so so generally on my hands on right so i do this hands on uh, for so you know follow this lab guide do fun okay so let me go to the start 
okay so one of the one of the problem which was there in the fit band device as we discussed right that the pairing process should be encrypted why because all the data transfer which would happen would uh, would be and process of man in the middle attacks are very less correct uh, similarly in this particular case there was no uh, encryption required there was it did not ask me for any key i was just able to uh just connected and uh, since i it did not ask for any key it just uh, uh, i mean all the communication which happened i mean all those cat attributes which we just now discussed was plain text and i would just show you what i did uh, okay let's start i think you can see my screen right you can see the pdf document right is uh, so uh, you can see my pdf document right yes sir yeah yeah, yeah. okay so these are the different uh, components which i used there was a raspberry you know, pi uh, smart fit band device which i told uh, which i used hdmi cable and other stuff i would uh, yeah the home camera is for another uh, attack which i would show you but for now bli The only thing I used was Raspberry Fit Band device. That's it. Okay. Okay. Now the first thing, right? So the first thing which you do on a Fit Band device is to check. As I mentioned, it's a forty-eight byte MAC address. Now, how do you determine that? How do you determine the value for that? So in a Raspberry Pi or any Linux machine, right? You run this command: hci config. Why hci config? because if you remember there is a host controller interface which is the in layer between your physical and the application layer right so that's the command hci config and this is the interface so here the bli radio name or the interface name is hci 0 and this is the mac address for that okay for for the raspberry pi device because raspberry pi device also has a bli radio in it in in build so this is the mac address for that now how do i determine the mac address of the fit band device right so so in this case i got the mac address of the fit band device uh, so i just found out that uh, under more you can get the mac address of the fit band device even if you don't want to do this you can still in the scanning part uh, while the device advertises itself along with the mac address it generally gives a make also so since you know that the device uh, make or the manufacturer when you bought the device you can identify that okay this mac address belongs to this or if you want to still determine the mac address this is the way you do it on the fit band device so just so there's a so there's a small circle button was there i just kept on pressing and i got the mac address now this is a scan okay so this is the scan which you see so what is this is basically as we saw in the pairing process or as we just now saw in the slide that the client does a scanning of all the available bli devices uh, which are there right so this is a command which you do it's it's a tool le scan and then i see the mac address which is uh, which was there for the fit band device right so it was basically starting with uh, a4 right so i see a4 which is here a4 c1 right so i know that okay this is the mac so this is the correct mac address which i found from the fit band device so this is nothing but the initial reconnaissance phase which we understood right or which we we saw in the previous slides that i'm just trying to understand that okay what is the mac address of the fit band device what is the value for it to which i have to connect to right now after this i enumerate the gad services and characteristics so in this particular case i used one tool uh, which is a gad tool which is available on git repo so i just installed that and i just ran this command okay uh, this is a mac address of the fit band device and i just 
uh, try to uh, get all the values for for the split band device and as you can see that the connection was successful and it gave me all this uh, values now as you can see what we saw in this slide right that what was the handle uh, so let me open that so as you can see that there is a handle there is a handle and, and there is a value for that handle then there is a characteristics these are the different characteristics which the fitband device provides and it has a unique this is nothing but the uid this what do you see right 0x12 0x06 all that right and this is a value these are the different values which you see here uh, this one and hey, sorry uh, this is the handle sorry this is the uid yeah which you see on the right so this is the uid this is the value this is the handle which you have and this car uh, properties i think it just has a unique value for that but that is of no importance we are just focused on the value which has and what okay this car properties sorry uh, this has nothing but the the permission switch it has read write or read or write correct so those are the properties here this is a read write permissions this is the handle this is the value and this is the uid but from this you cannot make right that what does 0x06 correspond to what does 0x20 correspond to is it read write is it only read is it only write so that is when the reconnaissance more i mean advance i mean you still need to dig deeper and understand that okay out of this characteristics which is read write because from this values you cannot just make uh, it does not make any sense okay now this is important thing i mean uh, so uh, okay it's going down now uh, in one of the reconnaissance phase right <coughs> sorry what i did was i once i installed the application i uh, enabled the logs uh bt snoop logs on the mobile phone okay so this is the snapshot of that um, so as you can see that you need to enable the developer options and this are the steps to do that okay so go to settings select developer options you need to enable that and then you enable bluetooth hci snoop logging and then disable and enable the bluetooth so what it does is basically the interactions of your application with any device on bluetooth would be uh, built in this would be saved in this file bluetooth uh, the name of the file is bt snoop hci.log uh so that's how I, i enabled it to just understand that how how the fitband device is uh, scanning or how it is communicating so i did that so this was part of the initial reconnaissance which you would like to do and which is very easy uh, as i mentioned that you go to developer options and then it's uh, the article is also available in google uh, and then yeah one of the challenges you need to enable developer options on on your phone uh, without that uh, the bluetooth hci packets are not done so once you do this basically you can uh, do any i mean you can basically capture all the ble communications from your mobile phone or from the application which you have installed on the phone to the, any device which communicates on ble then i did what i did was i opened so this was the application uh, yoho uh, application i installed on the phone which was being given by that vendor or that fitband device i extracted the bt snoop log file i analyzed in the wireshark that what are the different characteristics or values to it and then i once i understood that there is no encryption uh, involved in this what i did was i i started i basically built a network to do a man in the middle okay so what i did was uh, as you can see that there are two fit, uh, two raspberry pi devices right 
so one of on one of the raspberry pi devices i did a actual clone of of the fitband device now understand the reason i was able to do the actual clone was because there was no encryption required now once there was no encryption required i can just copy the all the attributes in in the firmware of the fitband device and dump it to my uh, raspberry pi device so this was a device which was responsible for cloning and this was a device with was another raspberry pi device which was uh, communicating to the actual application which was installed on the phone so what i did was once this device was cloned right uh, why do we need two raspberry pi devices uh, why can't i have one raspberry pi device because understand that um, you can have one raspberry pi device but then you want two bluetooth adapters right one ble adapter to communicate to the fitband device another ble adapter to communicate to the mobile phone right uh, or the application which is installed on the mobile phone but for some reason i was getting some errors so that's why i used to uh, raspberry pi device okay now after that what i did was once this one raspberry pi device once it cloned the actual fitband device characteristics i shared those information to the another raspberry pi device which was communicating to the phone so what the phone and thought was so the phone was actually communicating to this clone device uh, the which you see the clone device right? it was actually communicating to the clone device the clone device was sending the information to the actual fitband device so it is like man in the middle so basically i am intercepting all the valid communication which is happening between the fitband device and the mobile application i am intercepting it and then sending it to the actual fitband device so as a end user now the reason i have cloned the actual fitband device my mac address would also be same my make would also be same so as an application uh, on the mobile phone i do not know whether i am speaking to an actual uh, attacker or or to an actual uh, fitband device so the, that's why uh, this is what we call man in the middle and the reason i was able to do it is because there was no encryption imagine if there was encryption in this case then first i had to break those encryption channel right because then i cannot simply clone this uh, clone uh, fitband device first i have to honor the encryption levels and also i have to get that uh, six digit or eight digit uh, value for me to you know uh, for the pairing to be successful um, so since the encryption was not there that's why this was easy if the encryption was in place then first i had to break the encryption uh, by doing some kind of uh, brute force attack and then intercept the communication but uh, the the message which i'm trying to spread here is that Uh, since we generally look for cheaper devices but the security also goes for a toss and while i was doing this evaluation right so this fitband device i got it for 300 rupees but uh, on my floor uh, that time my colleagues were using like 1500 2000 uh, rupees fitband device even there the encryption was not there and when i showed them this kind of attack this kind of man in the middle attack they stopped wearing those devices and they just threw it so okay so what what next i mean i cloned the device what next now after which uh, as i mentioned that uh, what i did was um, that particular fitband device i just enabled the notification okay uh, so what do you mean by notification this is that uh, screen yeah so what do you mean by notification is that any message which comes on my phone should be seen on the fitband device we generally do right uh, when we uh, wear the fitband device or while you are running you want to see that any notification which comes on your phone should be notified on your fitband device right so one particular case in this case was that uh, i mean the use case which i was trying to show was that there is an otp which comes on the phone and the moment it comes on the phone it is intercepted by the attacker Uh, which you can see in the green thing um, yeah uh, after this there was this phone number which was coming and also the four digit otp 
uh, I missed taking a snapshot of that and I mean, now I can't go to office. So, yeah. So, imagine that this green thing, right? So, okay. What this is showing? As we discussed that there are GAT attributes, which basically holds different uh, characteristics. So, one such characteristic in this particular case was the notification characteristic, which you can see from this uh, IDs, which is the right CC0 uh, anything. So in this particular case, uh, and you can here see uh, notify. I'm not sure if you're able to view it, but uh, there's a notify green thing on the left side. So there was a notification characteristic coming. The hacker intercepted it. It got the four digit OTP number before uh, the Fitband device could get it. It just got that value and you know, uh, once it gets the OTP, it can just do an, any kind of attack. I mean, it can, as I mentioned that, yeah, uh, if he has also no, if he knows the account details, which generally is encrypted, but for some reason it gets to know the account details, and it can also uh, extract the amount um, in an unauthorized way from from your um, bank bank account, right? So this was one of the case. Then the another thing what I did was uh, I did a replay attack, right? So what I did was uh, basically I just got all the information which was coming from the uh, Fitband device. I just captured it, saved it in a file, and then ju just dump it uh, to the uh, Fitband device. So once it crashed, like there was a factory reset, uh, factory reset happened on the Fitband device, but on the other cases, it was uh, not happening. So I had to time multiple times and more data to send, but the the point which I'm trying to make is if if your communication is not encrypted uh, you you can do this kind of replay attacks or man in the middle attacks where you can intercept the critical information for the end user uh, save it play with it or if you want to have a or want to harm the end device like in this fitband device I just uh, did a factory reset multiple times if I want to do that I can it with a simple replay. So this is what I was able to do. And uh, believe me, this with band device, though it is 250 or 300 rupees, I still see many of them vary, right? So, I mean, uh, a few of my friends were wearing this. I just told them, that, you know, this is a vulnerability and then they stopped wearing it. So, uh, I mean, we should be aware that, yes, we should go for cheaper devices, uh, but we also need to ask ourselves uh, what is more important. Um, I mean, putting us in a trouble by by uh, uh, with the help of these attacks, or just completely ignore it and just accept that okay, uh, you know, whatever happens, I'm going to use rest device. So it's a individual choice, but this is what uh, you know. Uh, I mean, at least as, as I told that in my uh, on my floor, two of my colleagues were using that 1500 footband device literally through it. So. And that's what the awareness, that's how uh, we create this awareness by evaluating that what was the problem. Because ideally, I uh, when I started working on this, I did not know what is man in the middle attack or what it can do, right? But then when I saw that, okay, there's no encryption in it, then I installed these tools and, and the Raspberry Pi device and just did the, and just tried to test that whether, you know, the attack was successful and indeed it was successful. So... That was a vulnerability, that clear plain text connection, no encryption. And as I can say that, uh, and it was using a BLE 4.2 stack. And if you read the data sheet of 4.2, right, it clearly says that you should have a, a encryption pairing mechanism. And as I mentioned in my previous slides, that as a vendor, it's up to you whether you want to implement or not. Uh, I mean, you maybe due to cost, you are just overlooking at the security feature but then you can land into the troubles, not yourself, but the consumers who are consuming your products. Okay. Uh, one last thing which I wanted to show, right? The hardware one, I am skipping that because it would just be too much of data. If it was hands-on or in-person, I could have uh, covered that. Uh, the, another thing, right? Uh, yeah. This is what uh, we just now built and we are still working on that. Still working on it. So uh, as I mentioned that one of the problems apart from the encryption, right? Now, let's imagine that 
nowadays there is an encryption also i mean generally almost all devices have an encryption mechanism in place but what happens is sometimes even though the attackers are able to crack that encryption and are still able to extract the get attributes or the different data which i extracted right the hard uh, like in this particular case it was a otp though it was in the form of a notification but still i was able to extract it so that problem still happens that though you are encrypted someone would break your encryption channel even though it is strong but somehow it was able it's able to break and then can extract the data so what we thought of a solution is of profiling the end uh, endpoint bli devices i mean this was a project which i worked last year uh, internally in cisco and we are still working on integrating it to our own different products right so what we do in this idea is as you can see that there is an app and there is a ap ap is nothing but a access point which works as your master so uh, we had this mobile application uh, we had this application installed on a mobile phone which was acting as a client in this particular clay case it's the access point and the bli application uh, the bli application is sitting on top of ap and there is a end device in this particular case we just uh, i'm using a raspberry pi as a bli device and i'm running some scripts in that which would uh, send some bogus uh, get correct get characteristics just as a part of poc but in an actual implementation Uh, there would be an actual device which would be pairing with the ap okay now in this particular case the ap pairs with bli and as you can see that it first captures all the information from the access point uh, this controller the controller is nothing but an application uh, which is sitting on top of our dna spaces so our dna spaces is nothing but a uh, uh, a cloud managed solution which basically helps in onboarding different uh, devices in specific to iot devices right so once a ap gets all the information right so once it pairs it it gets all the information now what are the, now let's imagine that it was a fitband device it gets the information for the heart rate blood pressure you know uh, and and the fat loss and it gives to this application which is sitting on top of dna spaces now then uh, what we do is uh, we have we just determine uh, so there is a basically an analytics engine which is running which basically evaluates the different parameters which it captured i mean parameters in the form of heart rate and you know blood pressure so what were the values which it captured so it just looks it just tries to build different profile sets so first uh, maybe you know uh, for heart rate the first value was say 20 the third value was second value was say 30 the fourth value was say 40 the another value is was 50 right so after looking at the different profile sets it just builds a range of of this profile values uh, or uh, the values for this parameter the heart rate uh, value right so what it understands is the the value falls in the range between 20 to 50 so it builds so what it says is it once it evaluates like different samples what it does is uh, basically it maintains a master profile where it says that heart rate for this device falls in range between say 10 similarly for uh, uh, it falls between say 20 to 80 okay once it builds this master profile hacker has cloned that device okay by as i mentioned that just got the it was able to break the encryption or it was able to get the physical of the device and the way i did he was able to clone it even though there was encryption we just broke the encryption and he just cloned the device and just modified some values like for heart his value starts on 200 and uh, uh, the range starts on 200 to say 300 now the moment it is being seen by ap because ap does not know whether it's a legitimate device or uh, uh, a malicious device he sees that okay uh, it is using encryption uh, uh, and it has the same characteristics what it was before so ap gets that information and sends it to the dna spaces now dna spaces now looks at the profile because even if the uh, attacker has cloned 
the device, the MAC address would still be the same. So the key in the profile would be the MAC. The master profile database would look at the uh, database and see that for this MAC address, these are the respected values. Now, as I mentioned that the respected value for heart rate was say between 10 to 50. But for this, it advertises say 200. Now it sees that there is it is outside the range. So at that point of time, it just flags it to the AP that something is malicious. Do not try to connect uh, again. Um, so this was this is something which we are building. I mean, yes, the more uh, fruitful solution would be once you detect uh, 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 any threat or any change in the values, right? You inform the AP that you know. Um, break this connection or you do not accept any more requests from from the slave device so but still uh, we are not yet thought on that but currently we are just building that uh, what we are working on is building a profile database and then uh, flagging it depending on if there is any value of the parameter which falls outside this range so uh, currently we are doing this and yeah we are trying to integrate to our dna spaces and one more important thing uh, the one of the challenges in deploying security uh, frameworks in BLE is right uh, because BLE is one to one. You cannot have a Fitbit device communicate to ten different uh, clients. Uh, it's always one to one. Even if it is a mesh technology, you would always see a communication which is one to one. That's why uh, you cannot have many to one communication. That's why it's very difficult to you know to identify the attack and also at the same time to build the policy for that so always remember uh, this that really is one-to-one -one communication uh, though you can communicate to any other devices a, a number of times but it's all once you are paired to one particular device you need to disconnect that pairing to connect it to other device that you would have seen in, in your normal uh, BLE pairing on your mobile phone right so that's why the challenges are there and that's why uh, you know we thought that this would be a good idea idea to have or a good good uh, uh, feature to have in our product and that's what uh, we are working on but still uh, there's scope for improvement in this but yeah uh, we are taking one step at a time so this is what i had to share and yeah that's it from my side as i said i'm not covering the hardware part because it would be too much uh, data to consume at one go um, but yeah, uh, as I mentioned that if it was in person, I would have definitely, uh, uh, because the more, you know, hardware, right? The more you do on the hands-on, you just understand that what I'm speaking. And even, obviously, even in the attack which I showed, obviously, uh, while showing you in the PDF document, it would have not made sense. But if you do it on, actually on, on the, uh, with the hands-on actual devices, then you come to know that, okay, what you're doing and what you intend to, you know, um, attack and what you and where is the vulnerability and what is the end result and you actually see the Fitband device flashing and that's what just you know excites everyone so maybe um, when we are in person we can do it so yeah this was it from my side shoot any questions you have So our idea, this idea, which I was saying, it was nothing. It's basically the end goal is to profile the endpoint devices in determining that if any of the parameters are being modified. That's it. So, okay, go ahead. Generally, if there are no questions, it means. Uh, yeah, hello. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had put the question in the chat. Uh, but, anyways, so threat detection logic uh, do uses the machine learning uh, algorithms and uh, deep learning algorithms to detect the attack. That's what I my question was. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so basically, uh, currently we are, yes, there would be some kind of machine learning mechanism to be inbuilt, for sure. But for now, uh, yeah, uh, we 
I mean, currently we have no expertise on that, but yes, the end goal is to have the machine learning mechanism and to do it more faster. So currently the way we do it is like there's a script which evaluates those parameters and then, you know, compares it. But yeah, you are correct. And that machine learning would do it more faster. And that is what the end goal is uh, to do it, to evaluate. Uh, I mean, to determine one pattern, then apply the machine learning algorithms to make it more intelligent. Thank you. Uh, just had a simple question. Like you were using the Kali Linux for that. Mm -hmm. Is there any other operating system which does all these things? No, so uh, you can do it on a normal Ubuntu machine also. Uh, Ubuntu VM, right? Uh, the only thing is, uh, the reason I did Kali is because other tools get uh, deployed, I mean, get in installed successfully. But you can have a normal Ubuntu VM also. It's not specific that you need to have a Kali Linux. Right? But generally, if you see pen testing, they would use Kali Linux, but that was not the reason. I mean, I just had a Raspberry Pi which came with Kali Linux. In fact, the another Raspberry Pi device which I was using, it was using Raspbian OS. Uh, the OS by default, the Raspberry Pi comes up with. So one was using that, one was using Kali Linux. So, yeah. Uh, nothing like that. You can have a normal Ubuntu and you can still work on it. What else? Okay, I, I, uh, okay, uh, one task, okay, not a task, and you would figure it out, but uh, Think of this, right? So advertisement phase is non-encrypted, right? Now, what do we advertise in advertisement phase? Uh, it's only the MAC address and maybe the location information. Now, what if the, uh, and generally the pairing process is encrypted, as I mentioned, right? But what if, if the attacker is able, uh, is scanning the advertisement request, and if it comes to know the actual MAC address of, of the device it can do any kind of attack like like a ddos it could overwhelm the device such that uh, you know it just crashes or uh, basically it's able to track the location because it knows a mac address and if it knows a location it can do maybe it can modify the location or whatever so uh, maybe what i would suggest is i mean you'd get it uh, what do you what is the mechanism which has been built by BLE uh, stack from 4.2 to overcome this challenge? So I would just give you a hint. There's a concept of random MAC address and actual MAC address. Uh, but I would like you to uh, read on it because it's it's uh, much, sim I mean, it's very simple. But you, you, you need to first understand that why it is important, as I mentioned, right? Because advertisement phase, because nowhere, when when we are discussing on the pairing process, uh, we, so I would show you. Yeah, so if you see here, right? In the, in the advertisement phase, there's no encryption. So if the device advertises its real MAC address and the location information, the attacker can easily, um, Extract the location information and can also attack the device, right? So what is in its place? What what has been done to overcome this from 4.2? So the answer lies around random MAC address and actual MAC address. But I would like you to read on that. I mean, it's 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 like something you you would get it on the first page itself. So the idea behind this is basically they use a random MAC address in the advertisement phase uh, so that uh, even if the attacker listens to the advertisement, it can still not determine the 
actual location it can still not attack the end device because it's not the real MAC address. It's a random MAC address. It has to know somewhere the mapping between the random and the actual MAC address. And that's where uh, the there is so there is another step in pairing process called identity resolving key. If you have a random MAC address, so I know uh, this would go a bit. Uh, Oh, I mean, uh, I mean, difficult to grasp. That's why I wanted you to just read on that because you know the basic fundamentals. That okay, how a, a connection works, what is being uh, exchanged in the advertisement phase. So, so just read on that. Uh, I mean, now you know why random MAC address is being used. Now, just read on uh, if a random MAC address is being used. What is the role of identity resolving key uh, in 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 uh, in, in the pairing process. I mean, if a random MAC address has been used, how does it know that what is the actual MAC address to which it has to connect to? Because the connection request or the pair always happens on the actual MAC address. It never happens on the random MAC address. So who is responsible or who? what happens internally on the mapping between the random and the real MAC address is, is something which you can read on. The reason I'm not covering that is because it would be too much. You know? So once you're comfortable with this, then you just read on that. It's, it's not that uh, difficult. And it's also not something that if you don't know now, you cannot work on any BLE assignments. No, it's not like that. You can still work on that. It's like a gradual process. Once you understand that, okay, there's a new protocol, how it works, then I can, and then you can just read on IRK. Or maybe I can share, share. Uh, the link for that. Okay, so that's it. I mean, any more questions? Okay, what I would suggest is try to uh, enable those BTs new blog. Uh, yeah, it would require to have developer option enabled. But just try that. I mean, it would be fun. Uh, try to connect your mobile to another mobile on BLE and just, you know, extract the information and uh, and see it in a Wireshark. What are the different communication? I mean, what do we discuss of link layer protocol? Everything you would see in that Wireshark PK. So, Try to do that. Uh, another thing is, I mean, even I am doing it. Uh, I, I, I have started, I mean, uh, I have ordered a ESP32. Uh, it's a microcontroller development board uh, on which you can build uh, your Bluetooth code the way you want. So I'm just exploring that. That's something which I'm more interested to do it. Um, so yeah, that is also something which you can try and do. And in addition to that, you can always um, whatever devices which you are using, which is Bluetooth capable, always try to evaluate this different, I mean, what are the security loopholes, the way I found with this Fitband device, you can always do that. So, yeah. Okay, uh, let me know. What else? Any other questions? Okay. Uh, okay. So, um, sir, any? I guess if there are no questions, then.
Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, I hope this was informative. And yeah, I mean, yeah, in person is more exciting where where you have some. At least when you do hands on, you understand more. But I hope uh, it would be helpful for you in the future. And yeah, all the best. I think yeah. If we don't have any more questions, then I guess we are. It's four fifty-five. Yeah. So I think we can close and yeah. So you had any questions uh, before we drop off? Okay, uh, so I think if there are no questions, thanks a lot. It was great uh, interacting with you. And yeah, uh, look forward to many such uh, sessions, and also at the same time, hopefully, it's in person next time, so that uh, we can visit the IIT campus too. So. Okay, so I think that's it. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, and I know it would have been a long day, so now you can just relax and just, just chill. And yeah, I mean, maybe uh, what I can do is I can share my email ID with with uh, sir, and he can. Uh, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me. Okay, perfect. So, thanks a lot and